1890s, people from outside of, their, of New England are beginning to come. And when that happens, some of them are over the, some of the houses are over the top and the parish houses as well, as you probably all know and you'll see here. Um, sorry, going backwards. Um, this is the train station at Beverly Farms in 1900, meeting the train. And you'll see that every vehicle that's meeting the train is horse drawn. Six years later, this is the train at Beverly in 1906. And you'll see that this is, this is actually the first motorized taxi meeting the train in Beverly. But you'll notice there's a horse-drawn taxi behind it. Um, this period between 1900 and 1910 is like the Wild West. Everything changes very fast. So these big estates that have been built in 1900 to 1903 and four have huge carriage houses and as things are very rapidly changing. Um, after the arrival of the automobile, um, the roads became so dangerous that <laughs> Colonel William saw a soy, oh, uh, one example is that, uh, I'm gonna, I have a cheat sheet because I'm not gonna remember his name. Um, Robert Cooper's groom was riding, um, exercising his champion horse called Land of Clover. Um, on the streets of Manchester, past a Luando's um, laundry truck, laundry wagon, and was hit by a car oh. coming from the opposite direction. The horse was so badly injured he had to be put down. Um, a heartbreaking story. And so Sawyer, um, William Sawyer, who lived on Burgess Point in Beverly, where the park is, um, organized groups of people from around the North Shore in, um, it's not a syndicate really, but um, a cooperative buying up of property and building carriage roads through the woods. Um, this particular one is Cold Swamp Lane and Beverly Farms. Um, the only people who were allowed to use it were the members of this um, cooperative group that had bought, that would pay for the prop, the road, and the people who were abutters. Um, by the mid-teens, there were 30 miles of dirt roads like these, and I'm sure there are many in Manchester still. Some of them were old rights of way that had kind of gone out of use, and I've searched the deeds for this particular one. Um, so as things were changing over, the character Carriages, coachmen during this period uh, were really more for pleasure than for work, as in just taking people to the store, as they had been in the past. Up until the coming of the automobile, they were the means of transportation. So the coachman was taking people everywhere, doing the errands, all of that stuff. So this is a period of transition. This is one of the first big estates built in Beverly, and it was built between 1900 and 19, oh, it was built in 1900 and served, it lived, stayed until 1933 when it was torn down. So very short-lived estate. Um, Swift had died, Swift was one of the um, bacon two people. founders of Swift Meat Company. His bacon, brother was the- The bacon people. The bacon people, people right. <laughs> um, and they were from Cape Cod originally, but they had, were living in Chicago at the time that they came here and built this huge, um, I think it's, uh, somebody called it a um, Grand Central Station of a house. Um, and this is the carriage house, which is what was quite beautiful. <laughs> the servants living in the Swiftmore carriage house in 1900 um, were a housekeeper, who I think was the butler's wife. The butler was living in the house, she was living in the carriage house, and cooking and serving to these guys. Um, steel man, I assume, must be the blacksmith or the farrier. Um, so, two grooms, a coachman, and the farrier. Um, 
We happen to know about, I know about Dennis Mur Murray because his family lived in Devon Farms and still lives there. He's a handsome man, an Irishman who had come over um, in, the 18, in the 1880s, married, had this bunch of kids. His wife died, um, and he married a second time. And he's living in 1900, it says he's living in that carriage house. But I always find the whole family living on the estate. So whether eventually they lived in that carriage house, I don't really know. But I assume they had estate housing. Um, this is not his estate. This is the kind of carriage that was used at that time by the big landowners. And this is Dennis Murray's coaching horn. <laughs> Um, someone would stand on the back of the coach, sometimes it was Dennis Murray himself, and blow it to let people know they were coming. <laughs> and it's a beautiful instrument. This is Eagle Rock, Henry Frick's house. It was completed in 1906. It was bigger than the White House. Um, it's, not on the, it's not actually on the ocean, and there was a big fight over the beach rights. But this was his house, and Henry Frick loved cars. Um, but we haven't gotten to his cars yet. This is, he also loved showing off, as you know. This is his stable, which is still in Beverly Farms. Um, and it's now condominiums. If you're coming on Hale Street from Manchester, it's on the right-hand side behind a wooden fence. Um, it's a beautiful stable. <coughs> And his coachman was an Englishman named um, James Elmore. And happily for me, the Frick Archive has photographs. Mm -hmm. There are so few photographs of servants. They have photographs and they're very um, generous about sharing them. So this is James Elmore. Um, here, oh, sorry. Is that was Frick's daughter? This is a young Helen Frick. This is not Helen Frick. This is, a, this is, I think, one of Charles Frick's children. Um, but I love this next one. This is Elmore with Helen Frick's dolls. <laughs> <laughs> this is the stable, and it's really pretty incredible. Um, this is the downstairs. There are 12 regular stalls, <coughs> what, six box stalls. I can't, I, I'll shout, but it's a little hard to read what these things say. Um, this is the carriage washing area. This is the carriage room, the entrance. You can read this better than I. One of these is a tap room. I'm not sure. It's a huge area, and upstairs is equally impressive. This is the hay barn, the loft, and then this section were living, were living quarters. And James Elmore and his wife apparently lived here. They had a dining room where they served dinner. They all, they boarded, they um, cooked for the rooms, everybody else, so this is um, Elmore did. So this is the dining room, a sitting room, chamber, bathroom. It's a, a large suite. And then, I'm not sure, eight rooms for grooms, um, presumably visiting friends who came and had horses with them would use these, their grooms would use this area as well. The, uh, the one great thing from the Frick estate is that they had a payroll. <laughs> and this is the payroll in 1904. James Elmore was making $80 a month, which sounds little to us, but that was a reasonable salary at that time. And then they were being paid $100 a month for boarding five men. So those would presumably have been the other stable workers. Um, this is 1914. The coachman at that time is 
getting $75 a month, probably not quite as experienced. Um, and the three grooms still being paid reasonably well. If you think that, if those of you who were here last time, for the, the talk last time, um, the butler made $100 a month. The valet, I think, got 80. Um, and other servants were being paid more like the female servants were getting paid about $35 a month. The male servants were getting 50 or 60. So this is in the same range as the indoor male servants, a little more than um, footmen were getting probably. Um, Judge Moore, William Moore, was Swift's next door neighbor. He was not a judge. He was a judge of the deal. Um, <laughs> He was one of the original speculators. He owned, at one point, Dun & Match Company, um, Nabisco, um, the Rock Island. Uh, the joke is that he bought the Rock Island up the line on the margin, and that's the name, Rock Marge. Um, he, he also loved horses. He loved horses more than anything else. He paid more for his stable than he paid for his house. And this is the stable. Um, William Moore was, um, ran the New York Horse Show in Madison Square Garden. And um, Cecily, Cecily um, Pollard, who's here, whose father worked for Moore, we'll hear more about him later, has programs from the New York Horse Show during the time that um, Moore was running it. He also ran summer horse shows in Pride's Crossing, so people would be bringing their horses in from around the country um, on the train to participate in this show. Um, thanks to, again, to Cecily, I have this clipping about Thomas Powers, who was his coachman. And I think his story is interesting. He immigrated from Tipperary at the age of 14, um, worked as a groom's apprentice in New York City, was hired by someone and moved to um, Beacon Hill. And the story about his marriage is great. He spent a lot of time, of course, sitting in the coach outside in the rain when his Mr. Burnham, presumably, was visiting. And one of the housemaids, or kitchen girls, I don't know which, would bring him tea. Yeah, he married her. <laughs> um, he was hired by Swift as a groom and moved to Pride's Crossing. When Swift died, uh, no, no, I guess not before he died, sorry. He was hired by Judge Moore first as a groom and then as a coachman. And, and actually, Swift did die very quickly, so I think he may have just died and that's when he got moved. Um, then after Moore's death, um, he moved to Brookline, worked for Quincy Shaw and Pride's Crossing, worked for Freddie Prince with his polo ponies, and finally, for many years, worked for Bayard Tuckerman at Flying Horse Farm in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. When that burned down, Tuckerman didn't rebuild, and Thomas Powers retired. But that was a long yeah. time of working with horses. He, and he, in his retirement, according to his, I don't know when he died, this was, um, an article on his 100th birthday, and he said he was still he, still going to Suffolk Downs and <laughs> playing with horses, having a good time. Uh, this is someone who worked sort of at the opposite end of Rock Marge's um, horse people. This is James Barry um, and his wife, Catherine Pendergast Barry, who had been, been a servant somewhere, and he married her. And the Barrys did very well. Um, he was a teamster for Morse, for more. Um, working with the gardener, doing heavy work around the yard, hauling. And he was able to buy this very nice house in Beverly Farms, um, two family house on the end of Pickett Street, a house that had been moved there after an estate had been built on its original land. Um, and this is his daughter Helen's memory, which I love. My father rode his bicycle back and forth, leaving the house a little before seven and returning for dinner at noon. He used to leave singing, usually 
Bye bye my honey, bye bye my honey. You stole away my money, stole my, away my money, bye bye. I'm going far away. Or with a bundle on my shoulders where there's no one could be bolder, etc. He liked to have time to pitch horseshoes with some of his friends before the afternoon work began. He got home by 5.30. His work week included Saturday, and on Sunday, he used to have to go over there to feed, twice a day to feed the horses. Uh, fix that, it's unfixed in this. Um, he called the trio Tom, Dick, and Barry. Um, he, had, he earned enough money so he was able to go back to Ireland on a visit a couple of times. Um, he and his brother both seem to have been very successful um, immigrants working in not terribly um, well-paying jobs. All right, in 1940, um, El Elio Sears purchased the uh, Frick Estate, uh, rather the Frick Stables. Um, she, how many of you know about Elio? Okay. For those of you who don't, she was a piece of work. <laughs> Elio Sears was born in 18... Eight, oh, sorry. Yeah. Elio Sears was born in 1880. In 1890, 1899, she rode astride in the New York Post show. Women didn't do that. Um, she was an incredible athlete, a crack tennis player. She used to um, break into men's polo games and play with them. Um, when it's a group, group of guys, walked 100 miles in California. She said, I can do that, and did. Uh, she was the first person, not the first woman, to swim from one, uh, two or three miles from one beach to another in Newport. Um, she, at 50, I think, she was still on an international squash team. Um, she was amazing. And she was also an out lesbian before that was the thing to be. As soon as her mother died, she quit pretending. Um, but she was not known for being a sweet lady. <laughs> um, one of the Vaughn, I, I trying to remember what Vaughn it is, one of the, one of the Vaughns who lived across the, whose family lived across the street from her carriage house said when he was a little boy, he and his brother were playing in the sand outside the, at the end of the driveway, and Elio and her, show, and her groom came by uh, on horseback. And he said, being polite little boys, we said, hello, Mrs. Sears. And she looked at her groom and said, tell those delightful little boys it's Miss Sears. And Alan said, I am the delightful little boys. <laughs> Um, she was known to take her horse with after kids if they were in her way. Um, however, um, she loved horses and was extraordinarily kind to them. And anybody who was good to horses was good, was okay with Elio. Um, in her in her later years, she had a racing stable in um, Virginia and raced brought them up here, raced at Rockingham. And um, Ted Power's father and Richard Thorndike as a young man both spent time in her stables. And this was the routine. Feed the horses morning and evening, clean the stalls, put the horses out to pasture, ready the horses for riding and rub them down afterwards, keep the tack and carriages spotless, sweep the stable and arrange decorative straw around the stalls, rake the driveways. Ride and lead horses to myopia without breaking a sweat. Um, this is Jimmy Hannon, and this is this is not entirely a chronological talk because I'm talking about stable people first, and then I'll go on to show first. Jimmy Hannon um, came from Ireland in the early 1950s, and was a fabulous man with horses. He worked for one of the Dexters on um, in Pride's Crossing, and he also worked for Elio. His daughter Peg remembers that this door, this horse, Casir de Spree, um, could count and did, did tricks. Her father was supposed to have once ridden him to the Tunapoo Inn and maybe in the door. I'm not sure if he did. That was the local bar room. Um, he was a very accomplished man. He had come from Ireland with no knowledge of anything except horses. He bought his family half of this house on Haskell Street. He was famous for being an expert breeder. 
so he would be have jobs lined up at the new york horse show before the show he got five dollars a braid so five dollars for the main five dollars for the tail he earned enough money to open his own riding stable on what was boulder lane in beverly farms it was eaten up by 128 and that ended it obviously he's an extraordinarily happy man when elio died um she she had died after having alzheimer's her um the woman who had taken over as her housekeeper ended up dominating her breaking the will doing all kinds of terrible things and when everything in the stable was sold at auction the auctioneer didn't know how to sell it so he got jimmy hannon to help him and and when and he said i appreciate you helping me what would you like to have and when he took because he wore the same shoe size as elio so he got a, a pair of elio's riding boots and when jimmy hannon died he was buried in elio's riding boots <laughs> These are, um, they, I should tell you, the only other source for how much people were paid is the 1940 census, which was an incredible census that includes all kinds of information, including wages. So I've given the figures underneath for comparison. A teamster for more was making $1,280. If you look below, you can get an idea of what other people were getting paid. And it's, these are equipment, the equivalent that I've given um, is based on what's called an inflation calculator. But it doesn't really work because what it still looks like these people weren't doing very well. But standard of living has changed so much. We have set much higher expectations than people had then. They were really living quite well for people of their time, um, even though that doesn't look like very much money. They weren't rich, but they were doing okay. Um, okay, we're gonna switch now from the stable to the road. Uh, this was in North Shore Breeze, I love it. Uh, Central Square of Beverly Farms is right where you turn down on 127. So in one hour, 99 automobiles and 67 carriages passed through Central Square. And North Shore Breeze went on to say that, you know, Bear the North Shore had gone automobile crazy. Uh, these were advertisements in the 1970 um, North Shore Blue Book, which was the um, who's who on the North Shore. There were two different ones. So you notice this is this fellow's doing both, yeah. carriages and automobiles. Yeah. Um, there was one automobile sales place in Manchester on 65 Middle Street. Oh, excuse me, that's Gloucester, Beach Street in Manchester. And he was also the only place you could go for um, automobile repairs and... Oh, no, there, sorry, there was somebody else doing repairs. Stanley. Car Stanley. Um, autos tired. <laughs> um, chauffeurs at this time had to be mechanics. So when a chauffeur got hired, his, the expectation was he could fix the car. It was his job. Um, there were repair people, but not very many, and cars broke down all the time in the old days. Um, this is Henry Frick's head chauffeur, and I love these pictures. Here he is li lined up you know, like a cat with their mice. <laughs> three different kinds of automobiles and bicycle. And here he is driving the big open car. He was French. I know very little about him. I don't know if he married, um, but I know he was well paid. So this is the payment. So George Dupre, his first, the first chauffeur, the number one chauffeur, is getting $135 a month. Now, if you were here for my other talks, the butler made 100 a month. The chef, who was the best, this is from Frick's payroll. The chef, who was the most highly paid, got 150. 
Um, so he's between the chef and the butler, and he's doing well. And notice this, they had three chauffeurs working at the same time. So one for Henry Frick, one probably for his wife, and maybe one was doing errands, I don't know. <laughs> um, this is the one that kills me though. John Doyle's the car washer. He's getting $70 a month. That's more, the, the second in command in the house, the, the assistant butler was getting 80. Um, Mrs. Frick's maid, her personal maid, is getting 35. Of course, the women were getting, the only person who got more than Mrs., the only person, woman who got a lot was the housekeeper and she got 100. But men were doing much better, as always. <laughs> Alright, this is the car house. And if you drive from Beverly to Manchester on um, 127, when you come to the Frick Estate on the right, there'll be a, a huge gate that goes nowhere. And then like what had been a paddock. If you look up to the right, you'll see this building. Um, this was the cow ca ca the car house and um, the electric plant. And I got these, I wrote to the Frick Archive and said, do you have plans for this building? And they did. So this is it. This is the downstairs. So here, um, I'm sorry that it's not easier to see. This is the main room for the cars, and there's room here for four automobiles. One, two, three, four. This is the car washing area. This whole area is, the, and then this is the repair area in the back. So this is a, a garage, like a, a repair garage with everything in it. Um, these are huge batteries, and these are boilers. Um, this produced the heat for Eagle Rock, and I don't know if it produced all the power or not. Um, it may have. Be Beverly Farms had been electrified by this time, but I'm not sure if Frick used it or used his own. So this is the downstairs. And this is the upstairs, which was rearranged, so it, which makes me think that maybe just Cree was married, but I'm not sure. Um, but there are three bedrooms here, and they're one of them larger, a little larger than the other two. Um, a dining room, a sitting room, pantry, um, bathroom. So I presume that all three chauffeurs lived in this house. And for if Dupree, if Dupree was married, maybe his wife lived here. I, this is where it's very frustrating. The, um, there are city directories for Beverly that tell where people lived and who lived in the house, but it doesn't include stuff on estates always. So, I don't know. Um, here's George taking the family various places. And if you've never seen a picture of Henry Frick, there he is. And I love this picture of George in his bathing costume on, I think, West Beach. And I don't know who the lady is. Here they are. Um, the other thing that I don't know, I, I assume with him that he traveled with the family, that he came here for the summer, and that maybe these cars stayed in the car house over the winter. Um, because Frick lived in New York, he also had a place in Pittsburgh, and I think somewhere else. I, I love that the Frick Archive has bills. <laughs> this is um, this is for his transportation from New York to Beverly to Pride's Crossing, including his his fare, his money for tips, his meals, and then some other things he's bought along the way. Um, this is uh, the cleaning bill. Chauffeur's suit, naphtha. Clean, pressed and prepared, three dollars. That was June, done again in July. So he, it's his bill of seven dollars for somebody in Beverly, I think. It's easier to read this on my computer than it is to read it here. Here are more 
Bill. Some of you might remember Whitcomb Carter and Beverly. Um, kill them automobiles. So, three dozen steel balls. Um, presto tanks, horn, half length. So, he's buying all the supplies and going back and fixing the cars in the car house. Okay, this is, this is the chauffeur I know most about, and this is thanks to Cecily Pollard and her family. Um, Ernest Pollard is a real success story. Um, he was born near Blackpool, England. Um, his mother was in the whorehouse when he was married, when he was born unmarried. Um, he came to this country in, oh, I forget the year, 1903, Nin thanks. And for the first 10 years, he's in New York, and it's not entirely clear what he does. S some evidence suggests he worked in a shipyard. I know I read somewhere that he worked on somebody's yacht. How William Moore found him, I don't know. But he found someone who proved to be perfect for the job. And he's the only chauffeur I know where he lived and what he did. So he's spending the winter in Manhattan. This is what was Judge Moore's house in Manhattan. This was, was the garage and the Pollard's house. Um, it was a convent for a while when Cecily and her family went down and visited it. It's now been demolished. Um, I love the story that um, Mrs. Pollard, uh, Cecily's grandmother told of when the, um, Mr. Pollard would drive Mrs. Frick to the opera. So she would listen to the opera on the radio. And when she heard the opera ending, she knew it was time to get dinner on the table because her husband would be home soon. <laughs> so, the Pollards spent the winter and school year, presumably, in Manhattan, and then moved to Beverly Farms. This is Moore's estate on the left. This is a house that many of you may recognize as being right near the Pride Crossing um, interchange. Um, there's been a new house built over here. This used to be the only one. And this was for um, Moore's upper servants. This Moore's house was down Payne Avenue. Um, and the Pollards lived in the apartment that was over here. There were two smaller apartments in the center and another large one here. Um, um, Powers, the Thomas Powers, the coachman at one time lived in this house also. And the gardener, the head gardener for Moore, always lived in this house. It's a very nice place. Um, this is Mrs. Pollard and her children. Um, and that's the lawn of their house, not Rock Marge itself. Um, in 1930, Ernest was sent to England to pick up a Rolls Royce. And the owners of that Rolls Royce are in the audience tonight. They're here from England, and they purchased this car. I think this is in their yard, perhaps. This is the license that um, Ernest had to get. He took his, one of his children, sons with him. This is the license that he had in England to drive the car. But the interesting thing is what he drove was the car without the body. So he drove that, he was at the factory, he learned the car, and he drove it to the boat without the main body on it. Then he drove it in New York to a company um, run by um, somebody named Wood, who specialized in building the bodies of cars. And it was built for spec to specification. And when we're done, if you car owners can tell us more, please do. Um, this is Ernest Pollard with his son. Um, 
in front of the Rock March um, stable, as you can see, which I think had become in part a garage by this time. Um, Moore died, uh, I forget the year, he died in the 20s, and his wife, Ada Small Moore, lived on until the 60s, and Ernest Pollard was with her that whole time. So most of the time it was Ernest and Mrs. Moore who she came to see as really part of her family. This is a picture of Mrs. Moore in her old age with Ernest Pollard. And the nicest thing that the family has are her letters. And I'm gonna move the microphone back so I can read them aloud to you because I'm not sure how well you can see them. She traveled a lot. And when she traveled, she would write to Ernest all the time. And this is one of my favorites that Cecily's shown before, and I would read them to you all night, but I won't. Um, my dear Ernest, I was very glad to get your letter in Bombay and, and hear all the news. Our journey is more than half over and has been a very wonderful one. We've been in parts of India almost never visited by Americans and rarely by the British. And instead of finding everything very primitive, we find greater luxury than anywhere else in India. The native rulers are well educated, most of them um, having been to England. And as they have great wealth, they surround themselves with every comfort. As they have no hotels for foreigners, we're state um, guests, and in most places are entertained by the rulers themselves. In the past week, I've had the use of a Rolls Royce um, in fact, here, which is the most out-of-the-way place we visited, uh, the Maharaja has a Rolls. It's nickel-plated and lined with cream satin, and it's very gorgeous and comfortable. Two weeks from today, we'll probably be flying uh, in Persia. Um, we're looking forward to it and um, meeting a uh, meeting off and those who have flown there and are enthusiastic about it. She traveled all over the world. Ada Small Moore became a, a collector of Asian art, particularly Near Eastern art, and founded the collection at Yale University. Um, but here's another one that I love. Dear Ernest, I had a nice little chat with Mrs. Pollard yesterday, and she gave me the news that you were pre your preliminary operation and everything was going nicely. An hour or two later, I talked with Dr. Childs, and he went into more detail, of course, and said the doctors were all well satisfied with your operation yesterday. He told me that they found things well placed and feel very satisfied with the future. <laughs> and you seem to be in very good condition. So we're all feeling happier and more comfortable today. The doctors speak of your good general physical condition, which will be very helpful. Mrs. Pollard promised to keep me informed the members of the family are all interested and send their greetings, including my granddaughter, Mrs. Case, who dined with me last evening with her husband. McKay is doing very well. He took Miss Enders and me for a drive the other day. We both miss you sitting up there in front, in front of us, but he drives well and is in every way acceptable. <laughs> Always your friend, affectionately, Ada Small. Um, um, that one's 1929, this one's 1949. Um, she was very fond of the family. I, one of the letters that Cecily showed me is a, a letter she wrote after Cecily wrote her a sympathy note, on, or after Mrs. Mrs. Pollard wrote her a, a sympathy note, I think probably on the death of a grandchild. And the Pollards had lost a son, and Mrs. Moore writes back saying, you know, thank you, I know you understand, because you've had the same experience. So they were very, very close. Um, Charles Scully, whose grandson Tom and granddaughters are here, um, became a, a chauffeur to Philip Dexter the same year that um, Mr. Pollard became chauffeur for Judge Moore. So similar times, very different circumstances. This is Boulder Wood, which is Cynthia's Cummins house in Manchester, uh, a beautiful estate. And we know about 
um, Charles Scully how he got the job. Um, he had come from Northern Ireland as a child with his mother, um, widowed mother, and sisters and brothers had gone to Lowell, where an older brother was working um, as a machinist, I guess. And Charles was there, grew up there, became a machinist, and then when the United States Machinery was formed, in, he married, was living up there with his brother, and when United Street Machinery was uh, established in Beverly, the two of them got jobs down here. They rode their bicycles down from Lowell, stayed in Beverly during the week, and then they rode their bicycles back to Lowell to be with their families on the weekend. Um, apparently, uh, Philip Dexter knew one of the managers at the United Street Machinery Company and said, he would, and said he was looking for a good machinist, somebody who could be a good chauffeur. And he recommended Charles Scully. So this was wonderful for the Scullys. It meant that he no longer had to commute to Lowell to be with his family. Um, he came to work in 1913. That first year, um, Tom, what year was Boulder Wood built? 1908. So the house was new, and it's not clear whether the, maybe the chauffeur's quarters weren't really ready yet, because the first year or two, the Scullys lived in other places in Manchester. Um, in, 1913, in 1913, they were living on Vine Street, but by 1915, they were living on the estate. Um, and like most chauffeurs, they were living in a house that was a, an apartment that was over the garage. Um, so here's the part of the Scully family. Um, Mary Scully gave birth to nine children. Um, one died young. The rest all grew up in the house. And this is, you see a little bit of the garage and the house behind. Um, his story has a different ending, which I'm going to say for a little bit. So all of the, fa the children were, grew up on the estate. Um, the, the, the Scully family story is that Mrs. Dexter wasn't crazy about Irish people. And um, the, Irish, the, the Scully children gave her reason maybe not to think it was great to have these wild kids there. Um, one story is that two of the kids, on a day that they knew that she was having a garden party, um, put frogs in the fountain <laughs> in the courtyard. Um, Another day in the winter, they wondered what would happen if they pulled the cow out on the ice. <laughs> so they did. And I don't think that Mrs. Dexter ever found that out because they did get the cow back. <laughs> but it wasn't easy. <coughs> um, we'll, we'll come back to Charles Scully later. Um, I have this in because it was very rare to have a local guy, and especially an Italian, become a chauffeur. But Tom Rizzoli, who was a, one, a son of one of the first Italian immigrants who came to Beverly Farms, uh, did get a job for the, with Bayard Warren. Bayard Warren lived in the house that's the main building of the Landmark School in Pride's Crossing now. Um, here he is on the beach in his uniform. He didn't stay with it. I don't know what the reason was, but I think he earned more money working at the um, at the Boston Navy Yard and moved there and didn't stick with chauffeuring. Here's Elio again. Um, and I love the story of Elio's chauffeur. Um, Elio called herself a pedestrianist. She walked. And she was especially known for walking every year to Providence and back. I'm not, not back, one way, I think. And Tom Green, her faithful chauffeur, would drive along behind her with sandwiches. But um, as I said, Elio wasn't noted for being a lovely woman, but she was a lovely woman to Tom Green. Um, Tom Green had been chauffeur to Alfred um, Vanderbilt, and Al she was a friend of the Vanderbilts. Um, her sort of pal, pretend boyfriend was Mike Vanderbilt, and so I think Alfred was probably his uncle. And when Alfred um, Vanderbilt went, was, died on the Lusitania. 
And when he died, he left his chauffeur, chauffeur's wife and young child with nowhere to go. Um, cars were sold. I don't know what happened to Mrs. Vanderbilt. I don't know the story. But the chauffeur lost his job. And Elio hired him. And Tom Green stayed with her until she, she died or until he retired. Um, one story that may be apocryphal and may not be is Elio was, I think, sometimes a wild driver. Um, one story was that he pretended to be driving when she had had an accident and actually went to jail for a little while. I don't know if that's true, but it's a good story. Um, my favorite story is one of the um, ordinary folks in Beverly Farms um, told me the story of her mother, um, who didn't have a driver's license, but used to drive the family truck around Beverly Farms, take, doing things with the kid, you know, taking kids somewhere or going shopping or something. And one day, her, her mother hit Elio's car. <laughs> Elio wasn't in it. Tom Green was in it, and she, she thought, my God, she was going to die. You know, they'd take, she'd be in jail, all this stuff. And Tom Green got out of his car and looked at Jane, at Mrs. Fanning, and said, you know, this would upset Miss Sears. I don't think we'll tell her about it. <laughs> and he took care of everything. Um, um, so anyway, he stayed with her, and I'll come back to him later on in the story. But here he is behind her, walking. This is one of Elio's cars. This, Elio's cars were all this deep, kind of maroon color. And if you want to see them, they're in several automobile collections. I know one of her, one of her cars is at the Owl's Head Transportation Museum in Maine. I'm not, and this one, I think, is in a private collection. Okay, here's sample chauffeur's pay in 1940. And look at Ernest Collins. He's making more than the Beverly Chief of Police <laughs> at the time. And even more than the Never. Nicholas Lawler who ran the piggery. <laughs> um, and garbage collection service on Preston Place. So there's a great variation. Okay, what were the perks? Um, there was a closeness between chauffeurs and members of the family that really I don't think anybody else had. They spent, the man of the house and the woman of the house probably spent more time with the chauffeur, alone time, than anyone else did. So the chauffeurs, knew all the family secrets. Um, there's a story of Robert Evans, who was the, um, the man who brought President Taft to Beverly. And his property was the property that's now the park, the property that's now Lynch Park in Beverly. Um, apparently, the, he, and, he and Mrs. Evans had no children. But apparently, he had an illegitimate child in Canada. And the chauffeur drove him to Canada to see his son. So the, the chauffeur knew the story, but kept his mouth shut. Um, chauffeurs also got tips. <clears throat> Many chauffeurs invested their money well because of advice from the people who they worked for. Um, Ernest Pollard invested in Nabisco, and for years the family would, as stockholders, would get Nabisco packages at Christmas time. Um, they also had the ear of their employers. And there's a rather sad story in Beverly Farms of a, um, a gardener um, on an estate where there were some thefts. And the gardener had been there for many years. But the chauffeur told the owner that the gardener was the thief. And the gardener was fired. No questions asked. It turned out the chauffeur was the thief. And when the owner of the property tried to get the gardener back, he said nothing to him. He had a gun, but he didn't return. Um, 
this is another letter to Ernest Pollard. William Moore didn't leave him anything in his will, but Mrs. Moore said he meant to, and Ernest Pollard was given $1,000. That's the letter. These are samples of chauffeurs' houses. Chauffeurs, this was a real perk for chauffeurs had housing. And as had um, coachmen. But they had they often had housing for their families as well. This small house is um, a private home now, but that was the chauffeur's house for Sunfield, which is in, on, on Oak Street in Beverly Farms. This is a was a chauffeur's house on Valley Street. Um, this is a this is the gardener's cottage, stable, garage, chauffeur's quarters at Edgewater House. There, that estate combined everything. Um, this is a beautiful little carriage house that's on um, on Beach Street on the way in Beverly Farms now. Most of these little houses have been turned into lovely modern. I didn't show you the rest of this because it's all most of it's addition now. <coughs> there were perils to being a chauffeur. Um, this one is uh, Neil Rantoul's chauffeur getting stopped for speeding in Manchester. <laughs> and I'm not sure what this is. He was going 25 miles an hour. <laughs> um, the chauffeur who got in the most trouble was a part-time chauffeur named Collins, who was working for Joe Leiter at Edgewater House. And one of the jobs that the, the chauffeur and the gardener had, apparently, was dragging in all the um, rum run liquor that was coming in on the beach. And this is a long involved story where the stuff got stolen, the police finally, um, they, they were going after the uh, night watchman who was clearly in collusion with the whole thing. And the night watchman says, wait a minute, this was illegal liquor and I saw these guys bringing it up out of the water. So both of these men were indicted, and I'm sure that Joe Leiter apparently paid, eventually paid them off, but it was tough. Um, but the, uh, the saddest story is the story of Charles Scully. Um, the family doesn't know what happened. They, their guess was that in the Depression, the Dexters were sick of having such a large family living on the estate. And not that they really cost them any money, but like other people on the estate, they were being given food from the gardener, though Mrs. Scully hadn't asked for it. But suddenly in 1937, um, Charles Scully was told he was fired. The family would have to leave the house where they had been since 1913, and um, that he had to drive to the station to pick up the new single chauffeur. There was no job security. So was there romance? I think you probably, many of you recognize these people from Downton Abbey. Um, and maybe there's, there were a couple of stories. One of them was that in one estate, the chauffeur fell in love with the daughter in the house and when the Father said you can't marry her, or he committed suicide in the father's office. That was not true. Um, the other one may be true. And this was that, and I think because of what the sources who told me the story, I think probably it was true. The daughter of one Brahmin family in Beverly Farms fell in love with the chauffeur and he with her, I guess. Um, it was ended by the father, and the daughter <coughs> never married, but moved into the vacant chauffeur's house and lived in it for the rest of her life, and was dead. So no happy endings where anybody ran off and married the chauffeur, or unhappy endings with that ending. There were real re 
rewards for service. Sam Cinnamon, who'd been the chauffeur to Augustus Loring, was allowed to live in the chauffeur's house that he'd had until he died, even though the property had changed hands. He continued to live in that house. Um, Mrs. Moore bought this house for, um, excuse me, bought the land for Ernest Pollard to build his house um, on Hale Street, not too far from where he lived during his life. Elio Sears, even in her dementia, when her will was changed completely, left Tom Green her house on um, Byron Street in Boston, where he and his wife were living at the time, and she also left him $100,000. Henry Frick left George Dupre's $20,000 in 1919. Um, I think that kind of generosity was rare. Um, William Hillis, the chauffeur who dro drove Robert Evans to Canada, um, remained stayed on as chauffeur to um, his wife's sisters after he died. And they bought him this house on Hale Street in Beverly. And they gave him a plot at Mount Auburn, oh, excuse me, Forest Hills. So he was buried with them. So in the end, made out okay. So that's it. Number two man at United States Steel. Okay. Okay. And Andrew Carnegie. Um, and Sears money is very old. Um, when I I was trying to figure out where it came from, and Elio's father and grandfather, her father was listed as a gentleman, and her grand or and her grandfather as a gentleman of leisure. <laughs> and so I think it's old sailing ship money. Okay, I think we better uh, pull an evening. Thank you all for coming, and you can all have a share with the community.